preserve the unity between ego and self at the sacrifice of other, be it man or nature. We strive against storm, sea, and mountain vastness, conditioned by a belief in a personal God. Attack upon this unity brings about psychological collapse and feelings of alienation, which we now notice in our society. In China, one seeks to create a fusion between self and other at the sacrifice of the ego. Nature immersion is the way. The self is the joy slowly upcoming out of the earth. Like the bamboo, it is at ease in the world, awed neither by mountains nor by winds. At ease, it is flexible and enduring. The ego, devoid of personal desire, responds with absolute directness to the world flux. Man may become a sage, be a part of heaven and earth, existing as a pure mirror, more transparent than the greatest clarity of a quarry lake in the bright sun. A flower does not talk. <laughs> Fundamentally, Chinese philosophy is probably a coming to terms with the understanding that there's a thorough interpenetration of opposites in all aspects of existence. So that in order to know cold, one must know hot. In order to know love, one must know hate. In order to know man, one must know nature. And for this reason, most likely, the two main streams of Chinese thought develop. Confucianism, fundamentally, the philosophy of action and interaction in social and human affairs, and Taoism, withdrawal into nature for a revitalization, so that one may know the inward path in order to exercise the outward. And for that reason, today, when we laughed, it was not out of place because if we, in fact, did not laugh, then that would mean that we were not taking the fundamental thesis of all mainstreams of Chinese thought seriously. The laughter lets us know that somehow we have a glance into it. The beauty of one flower is re reflected in the whole universe. The multiplicity of the veins and the leaves and the stamens and the petals the yin and yang of the entire universe can be found in one small flower. Just as the universe is contained in a single flower, so we can relate that to Chinese calligraphy. And the strokes of the, the flower, the stem, the petals, the, the leaves, uh, all contain the universe. Just as calligraphy, a ritual in pure form, has at its foundation the principle of qi yun shang dong, breath resonance, life motion. So does Fan Quan's towering work of the Northern Song, travelers among streams and mountains, take this spirit motivation as primal ground. In spite of the appearance of specific landscape elements, this painting seeks to manifest the attunement of the individual to natural forces. In place of controlling these forces, it evokes an atmosphere of subtle harmony in which man becomes a partner in the quiet dance of mountain, water, mist, and heaven. It almost has a magical quality about it. It sort of borders between the imaginary and, and the natural. Do you mean it's a combination or a synthesis of something straining towards the real and being yet surreal? I think so. It's, uh, it's almost like the spirit of the things that... Uh, that he's captured with his brush. He uh, almost makes the water sound as it runs over the rocks. And you can almost hear the, the footfalls of the travelers through the foreground and the sounds of the donkeys as they follow the travelers. By having different points of focus and no one place where you may grasp the entirety of the work without moving into it, you're urged or encouraged to live in the work. This is further heightened by a quality in this work which is very different from Western Romantic painting. And that is that in spite of the tremendous reverberations within the painting and the monumentality of it and the classical severity, 
it also has a quality of being at ease, at ease with nature and at ease with the gigantic mountain, at ease with the mist, at ease with the water, and at ease with the trees. If you look at certain of the rocks, you also see a tremendous amount of energy which Fran Kwan has been able to, to create with his brush. The way the rocks almost seem to be exploding from within in different forms, almost abstract forms. And I think even in the trees, if you, if you look at them closely, you can see that in reality they're sort of mosaics of, of abstract branch shapes and leaf shapes that all together somehow create an impression of naturalness. Actually, what I think is happening is that a given form is developing in the painting, already developing at this time and much expanded later on, which doesn't require the same Western sense of novelty or originality. In fact, it's pared down. It uses very little. It doesn't have the, the color interest, perhaps doesn't have the subject matter interest. But what it does have, it concentrates on more fully. In the pathways and seamways or waterways, being broken and going behind rocks gives rise to a feeling of being able to go there also in a sense of the mystery of the painting. Sort of wondering where they come from and, and uh, if there's a lake someplace behind that mist or, or where the waterfall falls into. And they look longer when obscured. Yes, I think that if you could see the base, the uh, painting would probably, probably lose a lot of its force. Well, you mentioned about the mystery, and I feel the same thing. It's, um, this valley is, um, as I also said, uh, it's a source of the mystery, and uh, we feel that this mysterious force coming out of this valley to the foreground and to this top of the mountain. It's this force almost emerging from this uh, uh, mysterious ballet. And it's very powerful. It feels a powerful rush as you move slowly through the painting. It is an active process, I think, looking at it. It's not like watching a screen or a television. I think you, you actually have to exert a certain amount of effort to move your awareness through its many different aspects. Yes, and I think to see such a painting properly requires, on the part of the viewer, a recreation of the work. And in a sense, in the best sense of the word, he matches the creative force of the original painter and then relates to it through that. But that's not easy. No, I think this, this has some relation to the, the Taoist notion of creation itself is sort of the universal process of growth and change and I think that, that this is something which is participated in by the travelers, by the trees, by the rock, by Fan Quan and I think the, the wish and the objective of, of the viewer is somehow to, to make himself a part of the creative process And the painter goes to nature to refresh his soul. He goes to the mountains and the streams. Yes, um, they speak of um, the nature which fits to you, which fits to uh, walk on, which fits to live. And, um, well, apparently the best nature is the place where, uh, which is fit for the human beings to live. But to live is not just to simply live and have a comfort, but rather live with this um, almost uh, uh, surrounded by the bone chilling uh, force of nature. And probably this painting is, has this quality. The Chinese are, are right in saying that what he's really done is to sort of find in nature and in reality its, its essential spirit and to sort of show us the spirit in its painting so that later on when we 
see nature itself, you can probably appreciate it more. The son of the great literati painter, Guo Xi, watched him at work and reflected. I, Guo Se, often saw my father working on one or two pictures. Sometimes he would put them away and pay no attention to them. When he felt inspired or elated, he worked forgetting everything else. On the days when he was going to paint, he would place himself at a bright window before a clean table and burned incense right and left. He took a fine brush and the most excellent ink, washed his hands and cleaned the inkstone as if to receive an important guest. He let the thought settle in his soul and then he worked. He planned and penetrated it thoroughly. He added to it and made it richer over and over again from the beginning to the end with great care as if guarding against an enemy. Then, even if the eye does not see the silk and one realizes that the hand does not govern the brush and ink. Marvelous, mysterious, boundless becomes that picture of mine. Men of the world think that pictures are made simply by moving the brush. They do not understand that painting is no easy matter. Zhuangzi said, the painter takes off his clothes and sits cross-legged. The heart should be quiet, honest, and sincere to the utmost. Then the various aspects of man's gladness and sorrow and of every other thing will appear naturally in his mind and be spontaneously brought out by his brush. Chinese opera constitutes a meeting ground of dynamic color and sound and subtle power and reveals the same ritualistic nature of Chinese art form that painting presents in another way. First time you probably go to a Chinese opera uh, and you don't know anything about it. It's it just really is overwhelming. Probably one of the first impressions would be the costumes and the, their way of, of speaking is not, it's not actually words, but it's more uh, their expression and what they don't say. Just like in, in the opera where the, where the expressions of the actors are just the, sort of the form that their faces take, is often as important as the content of what they're saying, the actual words and melodies and songs. I think often in Chinese art the same is true, that the form in which a painting is presented has as much of an impact on us as the actual content itself. Especially in the Fang Fan where we noticed that the strong verticality gave it sort of a, 
a feeling of magicalness and, and majesty. Chinese opera is a happy combination of singing and dancing. Every movement has the pattern of dance, and every sound has the rhythm and beauty of song. The stylization of dramatic forms into this singing and dancing may aid a Westerner to see further into Eastern conventions as a set of conventions related to those embodied in the West. A given piano piece by Liszt, for instance, may be performed in different manners by different pianists but each pianist must use the same notes and time. What makes Chinese opera alien is that it is from a different tradition, but a tradition which, when viewed closely, will reveal that it is primarily only subtly different from the tradition of the West. <laughs> The small part of the scene just shown may give some insight into the use of convention. Most Chinese opera will always look and sound repetitive to most Westerners. Now looking backstage, one sees actors who seem very like actors in the West. The application of makeup in preparation for going on stage is a matter of personal concern. It reflects how exact in portrayal an actor may be. There is a prescribed manner of makeup application, which is part of the established conventional tradition, yet at the same time transcends this in that the true character of an actor may be discovered just from his method of makeup application. His calligraphy would also tell you this. It's really not something which should surprise a Westerner who is familiar with the development of handwriting analysis as a method of character insight. Tell me what the relationship between Chinese opera and uh, uh, traditional Chinese uh, calligraphy. Can you please tell me what the relationship between Chinese opera and traditional Chinese calligraphy? Can you please tell me what the relationship between Chinese opera and traditional Chinese calligraphy? Can you please tell me what the relationship between Chinese opera and traditional Chinese calligraphy? 就是因为这个书法也需要有相当的磨练，而才能达到某一个境地。那么戏剧啊，也要受过相当的磨练。那么也这也是可以说是相同的一点。He said that in most places, Chinese opera and Chinese calligraphy is quite different, but in one respect, it's the same. Just as in Chinese calligraphy, the Right, it should be practice, and uh, then she can show his personality in his writing. And in Chinese opera, the actor should practice the role in the play uh, quite often. Then he can not only show the personality of the role in the play, but also his own personality in that role. <laughs> Have you practiced 
practice this instrument. You have been doing this drum since he was a 15 years old boy and he had trained in school for 15 years and then he worked for it and now he is 57. The sound of a drumstick may tell everything depending on how attuned the listener is. This attunement is very subtly religious in that it deals with the philosophy that influenced Buddhism when it first arrived in China from India. This attunement oriented philosophy is known as Taoism and has to do with becoming what one perceives. This musician may actually be gaining a peace of mind because all to him is the sound. That is to say, he is the sound, and the sounds you hear are all his thoughts. Nature being so pure and close to God is of great concern in Chinese thought. It may be sensed in the following early Buddhist song, although Eastern musical conventions are employed. beautiful thing about Buddhism to me is the experiences that come from the heart. Uh, I think that the philosophy of Buddhism, you know, is an experience and, and something that's very hard to define in words. It's, it's almost indescribable. And to me, it's, it's a heartfelt experience and not, not something of the mind. One 小吉阳的不介求 Buddhism, an experience of the heart, may be felt in ritual ceremony even by a Westerner. The heart is all that is there. The mind being just the sense organ, the universal Tao being the heart, the heart being capable of becoming an entire experience, perhaps leading one to an expression of Buddhahood. In Buddhist thought, life delineates itself on the canvas called time, and time as we understand it never repeats itself. Once it has gone, it has gone forever. So too is an act or experience we have. Once done, it is never undone. Life is like an ink painting, which must be executed once and for all time, without any hesitation, without intellectually analyzing why. There can be no corrections to it. This is Chan Buddhism, a later Buddhist development somewhat resembling earlier Taoist thought. The Buddhist painter, in his closeness to nature, released his imagination. He felt a unity with all that lived. Objects in nature were grasped, 
not simply as individual phenomena, but as part or reflections of himself, symbolic perhaps, yet nevertheless revealing an unseen reality. The spirit in the form was comprehended. was devoted to Taoism and in a sense reflected many Buddhist painters. Painters did not paint to produce beautiful pictures but to express a state of consciousness. To the Buddhist artist this was the greatest happiness and the highest form of reality. To paint this way, to act this way, to be this way, the artist had to learn that the whole exterior universe was but the garment or shadow of something invisible. Instead, the awareness of an unconscious existence was far more potent than the real world because there was a basic distrust of the human intellect. Understanding resulted from a spontaneous grasp of the present. It required the opening of the third eye, or one might say, the awakening of the intuitive faculty by which man becomes conscious of his Buddha nature, the spiritual spark in every entity. Real words are not vain, vain words not real. <laughs> philosophy of the East is crystallized in Chan Buddhism. It's actually very difficult to say exactly what Chan Buddhism teaches, because it really teaches nothing. Whatever teachings there are, they come out of one's own mind. In other words, we teach ourselves. In Buddhism is a spirit of man. In our experiences, whether participating in ceremonies, looking at Chinese paintings, or watching a Chinese opera, we should become an artist of life. We should let the spirit flow through and into our minds, fusing the head and heart, and thus letting us be with the experience. It is in the heart that the fundamental principles of life process must ultimately be found. Transformation of the world rests on cultivation of the self. The key to cultivation of the self resides in sincering the will. Sincerity is the foundation. All may be located within. Investigation of things of the outside world only functions as a clue to the richness which already stands within the heart. Chan Buddhism relies upon enlightenment which transcends particular things and thereby frees the soul from the individuation of time and space, the wheel of birth and death. Turning to the heart lifts the veil and reveals the mystery of the unity of the many within the one. Thus, the heart is the pivot point and the primal ground of all transcendence. There seems to be no one on the empty mountain. And yet, I think I hear a voice where sunlight entering a grove shines back to me from the green moss. <laughs> 